Introduction to Plato, Plato and Platonism, Part 4. Yes, my friends, we're about to have our own spookathon. This is part four of our introduction to Plato and Platonism. This final part is called the Cave Prison Industrial Complex. And perhaps that will make more sense when we get to the end. Uh, but the Prison Industrial, industrial Complex is a description of a situation where there's just way too many prisons and uh, perhaps Plato had a similar thought okay so we're going to talk about the allegory of the cave a story that Plato tells through his character Socrates this is in the Republic the beginning of book six and there are many ways to interpret this story and we'll talk about some of those interpretations but first I am going to give you a brief retelling of the story and I highly encourage you there's other retellings of the story through animation and claymation all over YouTube and you should just do a search Plato's allegory of the cave and watch a couple of them because they they're, they're quite interesting and uh, some of them are pretty spooky okay after that we can after the retelling we'll, we'll we'll discuss what this allegory might mean and uh, this is a spooky story so I have my candle here and uh, it's a little darker in the room to set the mood all right, well, there's a cave, and inside this cave, there are prisoners. The prisoners are all chained up in unbreakable chains, and they're chained to the floor facing one direction. They are forced to stare at a screen, and They've been prisoners inside this cave their entire lives. They do not know any difference. There's no other way they know of how life could be. They don't even realize that they are chained. Right? They just think they're the kind of thing, the kind of being that cannot move. And on this screen, that they are chained into a position where they have to watch. They see images, shadow outlines. And as these images pass across the screen, and the screen is, is basically a nice polished, maybe slightly curved end of the cave there inside. Right? As they see images pass, they call out the names of those images and they honor those among them that see something first or see a pattern and can call something out before it even arrives on the screen. And uh, these are considered the best of their, of, of their people. And so they, they, they honor and award those that can do that. Imagine your one of those prisoners, but it's chained inside this dark, 
dank cave, staring at a screen day after day. You might have some some experience. Maybe you own a subscription to Netflix. You spend a lot of time just staring all day long at this screen. Right? The images that pass across that screen. Okay. Well, one day something special happens. It's a miracle because these are unbreakable chains. These prisoners cannot move. But somehow, perhaps someone shows up and loosens the chains enough for one prisoner to be able to move, to slip from the bonds, to be able to stand up for the first time and to see around the cave. And that prisoner would be able to see that behind everybody is a raised platform. And there's a wall that runs along that platform. And behind the wall are people walking back and forth. And they carry over their heads these clay figures. All these different clay figurines of various things. You know, clay figure of a rabbit clay figure of a pottery jug. All different types of clay figures that they carry over their head. The people themselves are behind that wall. But what they carry is above the wall. And behind that is a torch. A single torch that casts just enough light to create these shadows that play across that back wall that everyone is staring at. So somehow this person miraculously is able to escape these unbreakable bonds and is able to see this elaborate apparatus and begins to realize that what she took to be real, those shadows on the back wall, or actually just that, shadows of something else, of these clay figures that are being carried. Now imagine that she starts to walk farther to the other side of the cave, and she finds there's a staircase and a path. It's a long path, it's not easy, but she climbs it. And she keeps going, and eventually she emerges to the exit of the cave. She emerges into the outside world. And she does that so bright, it hurts her eyes. She's in pain, but she still leaves the cave. And slowly, her eyes begin to adjust. And this makes sense, because her whole life, she lived in practically virtual darkness. So her eyes are not used to such brightness. But slowly, eyes do adjust. And she start, she's able to start to make out shadows on the ground, reflections. Maybe a reflection in, in a pool of water. And soon, her eyes adjust enough that she's able to see things themselves. And ultimately, she's able to make out, not directly, but that there's this sun, this sun that's so bright that if you were to stare at it, it would blind you. But she realizes this provides light to the whole world outside that cave. And it also provides warmth and, and it nourishes plants and people too. It sustains all life. 
wow, a wonderful place. She loves it out there. She never knew this existed. All right, let's take a quick break. It's the story where this prisoner has, has escaped the cave, the prison inside the cave. We'll see what happens next. But before we do that, we're going to take a little break. We're going to see the first half of another cartoon. And this one is from 1920. It's a silent cartoon. And uh, it's a Mutt and Jeff cartoon. It's called Mutt and Jeff on Strike. And Mutt and Jeff was created by an artist named Bud Fisher. And he starts off as a paper comic strip. And it's the first one that is successful in 1907. There were other cartoon strips before that, but this one becomes just highly uh, successful, very popular, and it's the first really popular cartoon. And eventually they create these, uh, on, in cinema, on the screen, these animations. This particular one is just brilliant. Uh, and it's perfect right now because, uh, well, first off, the, the artist himself becomes a part of the story and starts to interact with his characters that he has created, Mutt and Jeff. And uh, so that's just brilliant. There's this breakdown between reality, the real world, and the world of appearance, the fantasy world. And that's just what we are starting to see a little bit in this allegory of the cave, right? What is real and what is not real come into question. So, all right, let's watch the first part of Mutt and Jeff on Strike.
Oh my gosh. It looks like Jeff has completely disappeared. Is he gone forever? Will we never see Jeff again? Is it just going to be Mutt? We'll have to wait a few minutes to see the end of Mutt and Jeff on strike. Brilliant so far, right? Mutt and Jeff realize that Bud Fisher is making all this money off of them and all the things they do in this cartoon. They want to get better working conditions. Bud Fisher refuses to give it to them, suggest arbitration. And so they decided we're going on strike. All right. Well, we'll get back to that in a moment. But first, we have our spooky cave prison story. All right. Well, the prisoner that escaped, she loves exploring this world. But she is now convinced is reality. She thinks back to her prior life inside the cave, and she feels bad for the other prisoners. She wishes they too could see and experience this world and experience the freedom of not being all chained up, not even realizing that you're chained up not even realizing that you live in a cave and that there's more to the world than that dark dank hard stony cave well she decides she's going to go back to the cave to tell the prisoners who do not realize they're even prisoners that they are prisoners. So she returns to the virtual darkness of the cave. She's going down that long path and staircase. She can't see anything. Right? She's coming from that bright world back into darkness. And in that initial period, which could take a while, she can't see a thing. And she falls and stumbles. She scrapes her knee. She starts bleeding, and then she finds the prisoners. The prisoners in the cave, and they laugh. Oh, who's that? You're back? You disappeared. What's on the screen? Can you see what just showed up? She can't see a thing. And they laugh at her. They see she's unable to see anything at all when she returns into the cave. Her eyes are still adjusting in that bright light outside. But the prisoners don't know that. They don't know her eyes are adjusting. They see a fool who can't see the most simple things. It's going to take a long, long time to readjust to the darkness. She doesn't want to go back to being a prisoner in the cave. It takes mere shadows of clay models to be reality. So she goes over to one of the prisoners so she could show at least that prisoner what's going on. And she tries to unchain the prisoner so she can show them what she had seen. The elaborate apparatus of the platform and the clay models that get carried over the wall, where behind them the torch casts just enough light to produce those shadows. But the prisoners, they think she's trying to harm them, that their vision will be harmed like her vision has been harmed. And they don't want to lose their keen cave vision. They think she's crazy. And that whatever happened to her is going to happen to them. They'll become crazy. And so, they must defend themselves. I mean, defending themselves. They kill her. We'll be right back.
All right. There we go. The end of Mutt and Jeff on strike. The strike is over. And just want to point out the uh, portrayal of Native Americans in, in that cartoon. And uh, that sort of portrayal is exactly what Oisa, Charles Eastwood, was trying to fight against and why it's important for us to read uh, some of his works. Okay, uh, so let's talk about the allegory of the cave. And these are some, some student interpretations that I have heard over the years. Uh, first, it's a horrible ending. And uh, yes, the ending is tragic and violent and deadly. Uh, it is a horrible ending. Another interpretation I have heard is that reality is subjective. Right? That subjective means each person has their own reality. And the people inside the cave had a reality, their reality. And those who were outside the cave had their own reality. That reality is relative. Right? I don't think that Plato would agree with that, right? You can argue against Plato, but Plato is going to argue that reality is objective, that there is just one truth, one reality, but that appearance is something that's subjective, and that he wants to escape appearance in order to reach that one true reality. Another interpretation that I have heard is that appearances seem to be subjective. And when we take an appearance to be reality, then we are treating reality as subjective. So we're mistreating reality, the word reality, when we treat appearances as realities that are subjective. And there's a danger in doing this, that we can sometimes do horrible things out of how things appear to us rather than the actual, the real situation. And so that could explain what happens at the end here, that they, they it appeared that someone was trying to harm them, and in reality, they, they were trying to help them. But that if we take our, the appearance that someone is trying to harm us as a reality, we, we could do something horrible based on that appearance that we thought was real. More student interpretations. Uh, it's very hard to explain one world to another world. And you can easily make mistakes and misinterpret. It takes a long time to adjust to different worlds. And so we all live in different worlds, right? And sometimes it's hard for people from one world to talk to someone from a, from a different world. Uh, another interpretation. The story isn't real, but the idea behind it is. And that misunderstandings can lead to wars. Uh, so seeing sort of a, a bigger, more political reading of the allegory of the cave. Uh, some students have said that ignorance, they, they, they listen to the story and they take a message that ignorance is the root of all problems. And if we find the truth together, disagreement disappears. And so that the allegory of the cave is a journey from ignorance to truth but that as long as ignorance still exists, there'll be disagreements and there'll be danger. And we have a student interpretation that liberation and self-knowledge happen at the same time. That the prisoner when was only really liberated when they realized their own situation. 
think this is interesting and it really connects to uh, other parts of the course where we talked about freedom and liberation and uh, that with Plato and Platonism liberation occurs when we have self-knowledge when we know ourselves another interpretation that liberation is seeing the wider context of your situation so you can have sort of a local context but to really be free you need to see the larger picture right the prisoner needed to see that what was actually causing those those images on the wall another interpretation those who have knowledge have an obligation to help others using that knowledge and so there was a moral obligation for the prisoner who escaped the cave and sees things for what they truly are but there's a moral obligation to go back and help others and not just to stay within that other realm and this actually connects to this idea that philosophers who like to just sit around and discuss the meaning of things and what's the real definition of justice that at the end of the day they can't just be philosophers in that intelligible world talking about ideas that there's an obligation to come back into the other world where everybody else is and to use their wisdom their knowledge to make better decisions okay and finally this last one is one of my my, my favorites uh student talked about how the the allegory of the cave really sort of felt very real to them uh, they were one of the first persons in their family to go to college and they came from a neighborhood where a lot of people after high school did not go to college and after going to college and having their, their mind open to so many different ideas they felt like they had escaped the cave and then during break they came back home back into their neighborhood People were worried. What had college done to them? And now they're using different words and talking about things in different ways. And uh, there was actually aggression towards the student who uh, was returning to their neighborhood after a year of college. Okay. Um, so we're going to do a little bit more I'm going to give you a little bit of my interpretation of the story one interpretation among many but I want to give you some of my thoughts on the allegory of the cave but before we do that we are going to have one more break and uh, this is a commercial for a product that is was called clean and clear and we're going to watch this because we're almost clean and clear of Plato so this is in honor of that and this is back when Clean and Clear uh, was not a an acne uh, medication uh, as it is right now. When it, it's now owned by Johnson and Johnson, but originally uh, it was a brand created by Revlon, and it was just a a cleanser. So here we are, clean and clear. You know, ladies, no matter how often you use a greasy cream or scrub your face with soap, if you'll forgive my saying this, you still leave some dirt behind. So I'd suggest getting your skin thoroughly clean with... Clean and clear, clean and clear, clean and clear. Any soap, any cream, any lotion cleanser can get your skin clean on the surface. But clean and clear is the only cationic cleanser. Cationic. That means it can reach deep down to attract makeup and grime from five cell layers of your skin. Ordinary cleansers reach only the top cell layer, but clean and clear reaches five. 
lifts out makeup and grime that other cleansers leave behind. Remember, dirt-free skin is healthy skin, and your skin looks its beautiful best when it's clean and clear. Good idea is to try clean and clear yourself tomorrow. You'll say, my face never felt so clean, my skin never looked so clear. Thank you. All right, so let's get clean and clear of Plato. All right, so some, some final thoughts about the allegory of the cave. And uh, what I have to say is that this this story is really um, a story about the divided line, right? And how uh, in the human condition, and that we... Uh, start off in the visible world, right? We start off in a world of sensation. And that other world, which is a, an invisible world, right? It's invisible. It's not the visible world. It's an invisible world. The intelligible world is not seen. It is thought. And that world, that part of the divided line is outside the cave. And so this is a story about how one might try to go from the part of the divided line that is the visible world to the other part of the line where we have the intelligible world. And it's telling us that humans have been chained to the visible world. And he says these are unbreakable chains. And if it's about the human condition, then it's about everybody. It's about all of us. We're all prisoners in Plato's cave. And Plato's saying, we're all in chains that are unbreakable. But perhaps somehow, he says, some miracle, we might realize that there is another world that we can try to escape from this prison in order to enter that intelligible world where we can come to know reality and truth what things really are and not just settle for what theme, things look like to us how things appear to us so that we can journey from appearance to reality. Now, some of you might say, oh, I'm not a prisoner inside a cave. Where is this cave that Plato is talking about? Why is the prison a cave? It could just be a prison anywhere. Well, I've thought about that a lot. And I think I, I have an answer. I haven't seen this in, in any of the literature that I've come across. But here, here's my thoughts on this cave. The eye socket. In Plato, definitely, death was a, a, a matter of fact in life there, and it was something that was not so hidden as it is today. And he would have come across many skulls in his time he may have seen operations and on the battlefield, seen uh, things that you don't normally see. But if you do look at the eye socket, and you took out the eye, you would see that there is an opening in the back end that leads somewhere else. But that's not the way that people face. Right? The eye faces outward. So there's this other passageway, inward. Where would that go to? Well, that might go to the intelligible world, the world of ideas, of definitions, of rules and principles, of thought itself. And the eyeball. The eyeball when you look at 
how it's constructed and placed in there, it's held in place by six muscles, and tendons from those muscles, and ligaments. And it's held tightly in place. The eye can't really move. It can't turn to see what is in the back end of the sockets. It can't see that passageway. It's fixed, always facing outward, always giving us images. So perhaps we all, all are prisoners, just as Plato says. And the cave is our eye socket, and the chains are that which holds our eyeballs in place. And Plato wants to encourage us to, to realize that if we take the world just at sort of this face value, this is just what it looks like, we're going to miss reality. And that we need to stop and free ourselves by thoughts. And that this is something we don't need we don't need to we can do this at home. We can do this in quarantine, sheltering in place. That freedom, liberation for Plato requires just thinking about things. What do things mean? What does love mean? How how would I define it? What, what does compassion mean? How would I define that? What is justice? How would we define justice? What is courage? How would we define that? What is wisdom? How would I define that? That there's a liberation in trying to discover definitions that work. Right, that pass those tests. And Plato is saying this is how we live in reality, and this is how we free ourselves through using our minds, entering the intelligible world, and thinking deep thoughts, the deepest thoughts you can think. Is exploring that world is an exploration, the Plato and Platonism, of reality. Okay, thank you for watching. Uh, I hope that uh, you've gained you've gained something from from these videos. Uh, okay, keep philosophizing.